So the first thing I'm doing here is I just open the cover and get a lay of the land. Figure out what goes to what and kind of see what I want to do with it. All I need to do is disconnect the light from the rest of the power. Then I can snake in another wire. These wire strippers are fabulous. They're great for one-handed guys. You just pull the trigger and there you go. These crippers are made by Klein. I picked them up a couple years ago. Each time I put a crimp connector on, it's important to strip just the right amount of insulation, typically about a quarter inch. It shouldn't be sticking out too far past the crimp area. I always put a piece of heat shrink over the crimp connector to the wire, just in case something's sticking out. Here is my bucket of salvaged cords. I always clip all the cords off anything I throw away. You never know what you're going to need them for. Here I'm drilling through the cast base. I started with an eighth inch drill bit, then a quarter inch drill bit, then a three eighths drill bit. Gotta work your way up. used this simple method of zip ties for years to keep cords from pulling out the back. I put a couple on the inside and then one on the outside. Pretty much keeps it in place. The blue tool you see is the zip tie cutter. It pulls it tight and then cuts it. My dad gave this to me a long time ago. The engraved date on it is 1996, if you can believe that.
So here I have a multimeter set up to test for continuity. It will beep when you have continuity. Since I know the wider power plug tab is the neutral, I'm looking for the other one. Once I find it, I mark it black with a magic marker so I know which one it is, since both of them are white. It's really worth it to pony up the 20 bucks to get a heat gun. Lots of people use lighters or torches, but the problem is, is you tend to start other things on fire or melt wires you don't want melted. The heat gun is much more accurate and does a much better job. The second nut here is called a jam nut. You jam two nuts together. It's an easy way to keep the nuts from vibrating off.
you can see here I'm demonstrating my one-handed method for attaching cable clamps. I poke a hole with an awl deep enough that the nail will just barely hold. I stick it in there, get it started, and then I pound it in with the hammer enough that it won't fall off. Then you can snake the cable underneath. What I'm working towards here is I have a power strip up above the left hand corner of the shelf that runs the light on the drill press and also runs the blue lights on the shelf. I'm just tacking another light source on there so when the lights in the shop come on the drill press, the blue lights and now the light on the grinder all come on. Mostly it's just a time saver that I always forget to turn the lights off or I get tired of turning them on and off all the time. This way I don't have to deal with it anymore. If you want to see it on paper how I did it, all I'm doing is eliminating the connections to the light fundamentally. So here's what it looked like. We had the plus and minus coming in from the outside cord, which was black. That went to a junction of four wires. It had the black coming in. It had a gray going to the switch. It had a white going to the light and it had this red going into the motor. Where that goes, I don't know, but I have a pretty good guess and I'll get to that. On the white side, we had the white connected to the black and to a blue, which was also on the switch. Pretty sure when they built it that this was supposed to go here and the black was supposed to go there. But on a light bulb, it doesn't matter. You can supply power from either side and they got away with it. I fixed that when I rewired it. I never buzzed out what that switch did, but I have a pretty good idea that it probably works like this. That it basically somehow grounds out the coil when it's not turned on and it provides positive power when it is turned on. I don't even know if I drew this right. But needless to say, it doesn't really matter. All I know is that there was four wires going into the, the, the motor housing. There was two capacitor wires that went from the cap directly inside. Where they went, I don't know. And there was two other wires, a regular red and a dark red. Those went inside too. So the reason I'm explaining all this is that I want you to understand that you don't have to know how the wiring works to make this change. So what did I do? I eliminated this connection and I eliminated this connection. That's all I really did. The thing of it is, is I had a little pigtail here and a little pigtail here why put a junction between these two when I can just throw the pigtail out and just run this wire directly to the switch. So that's what I did. So in the video, you'll see I combined the black and red into a male connector. I crimped it on and I stuck it on the back. So all that does is eliminate this here. Same thing here. I took the white here. I crimped a, um, a female terminal on and plugged it right in there. Done. 
So what happened is now the two power leads for the light are no longer connected. So then you get something that looks like this. And now the light is free to be connected to an alternate power source, which is just snaked in a piece of cord from an appliance I threw out years ago and connected it up. That's all I really did. I don't even know, need to know how the motor works. So if you're interested, I have a sort of understanding of how induction motors work. Basically, you have a main winding on the stator that drives the motor when it's spinning. And then you have a capacitor that is kicked in by a switch just for getting the motor up to speed. It's called a starting capacitor. So that switch is uh, what's called a centrifugal switch where it starts connected and then once the shaft speed gets to a certain speed, the centrifugal switch throws out and disconnects the capacitor. And that capacitor drives another winding that's just for starting. If you watch very carefully, you can see the spark of the switch opening. You can see when the velocity slows down enough, the switch pops back to closed. I hope you can see how I didn't really need to understand how any of this wiring worked at all. All I was did was cut these two wires and then cut a few other things to clean up the wiring so nothing might accidentally short out. That's all I did. Don't need to understand anything. I probably in retrospect should have buzzed the switch out and made better notes of what went to what, but frankly, it doesn't matter. The important thing is I put it back the way it was. That's all there is to it. Thanks for watching.